Right, well here we find ourselves at another tree that we've shown you many times before. I was thinking about going up into it, but then you came live, thankfully, and uh, well saved me from killing myself, I suppose, or certainly attempting to. Now, um, we have got a leopard or for the of uh, us. We have got technical difficulties today, of course, but we are back. of Anselia, or the little looking tree plant with gorgeous yellow flowers, and it always is, for me, a... It's a... Apparently my old sound is not really good. Okay, let's go across to Noel and see what's happening her side. Sorry about all the gremlins, everyone. It does happen. I'm blame, blaming this wind that's coming through for no other reason than just because I can. All right, so we were busy answering a question about the difference between antlers and horns just before we got rudely cut off by technical difficulties. Again, very sorry about that. So antlers grow on deer and elk species, which don't occur in sub-Saharan Africa, unless you count the feral deer in Namibia, which someone brought over from, I believe, Europe. Um, and then all of the antelope species that we have here have horns. So horns grow once in a lifetime. They're bony protrusions off the skull with a keratin cover. Keratin is the same as your fingernails or your hair. And then antlers are grown once a year and fall off and then, ooh, see the wind, I'm telling you. And then grow back again the next season. Sorry, I've just seen what I think are some tracks. Just hold on a second, I want to have a little look. We're busy coming through an area where we see shadow, but we've also seen Tundi in this area as well, which is an interesting subject to discuss. I feel like it was leopard tracks, but I can't honestly see someone else has driven here. Um, so territories are defined, but they're movable. The boundaries are movable. And what you'll notice often is you'll have a territorial area, core territory area, and that's where the predators have their little ones. Um, and then they've got a territory that they move amongst and then a home range off of that. And it's it's not sort of defined, this is this. It's, it's flexible, like... Um, like a bubble. So if you were to blow a bubble and before you push it too hard and it pops, you can move the sides in. It's it's similar to that. And then the territory is actively demarcated using urine and vocal sounds. Um, and the home range is utilized. It can be demarcated, but it's utilized more for food and tends to have a bit more, more movement than the territory itself. So interesting little fact for the day. We've got some huge elephant tracks and I want to show you these Ellie tracks because this is a nice size male. It's not the biggest male I've ever seen but just to give you a relation. So I wear a size seven or eight in South Africa and in the States I'm a size sort of nine-ish. I'm gonna stand next to this track. Okay there's one foot two foot and then a half a foot right so our track is here see that elephant track and then when I stand inside of it it would take four of my feet pretty much to fill up this track probably a little bit more so this is a really big animal and that's just one foot so many of my feet to fill up that big male but now that being said I've seen a track of a male that's probably twice that size so although this is a good size male track by no means the largest a very good friend of mine that works in the Timbavadi, which is a reserve that's north of us, uh, north of the Manuleti, which is north of us, sent me a video of one of his walks yesterday, and he had four male elephants on that walk that are some of the biggest male elephants I've ever seen, but one set of tush was almost reaching the ground. It was incredible. Okay, my hat is blowing away again. Well, everybody... Again, I would like to hear from all of you because we've been so busy with rehearsals and a lot of them have been private rehearsals. I haven't had a chance to check in. So send me your thoughts for the day or questions or comments and we can chit chat as I drive along looking. Interestingly enough, and the, for those viewers that watch us often, we have days like, oh, very cool. Thanks, Senzo. Very, very cool. It looks like a step buzzer. Oh no. Oh, Sens, I'm sorry. 
Is he gonna land? Oh, he's landed since you have it. Oh, well done, it was a step buzzard. The step buzzard was sitting on top of this termite mound and I was assuming it was probably picking out little winged alites. I'm not going to back up because I don't want it to fly away again. But it would be nice if it showed us its head. There we go. Picking off insects off the branch of that, that marula tree. Insects are a huge part of many animal species diets with, well, across the world. But, you know, since we're in the African bush, we'll talk about the African bush. Uh, lots and lots and lots of protein in there. Now, the termite mound that it was on earlier, the biomass of those termites is larger than any other combined species across the world, as a little side note for today. Now, the reason why I say step buzzard has to do with the coloration of the legs and the coloration of the fur. But something that I have to continually work on as a guide always is uh, birds of prey during d different juvenile stages with different colorations. So eight times out of ten I'm correct and then the other times I have to go back and look. But this is what my gut feeling is telling me. And I'm so sorry he's hiding his little head away. Sens, do you want to risk it? We can try him back up. What do you think? Maybe. Let's try. Very... Here we go. Don't fly away, little bird. Oh, no. Sorry, everybody. He's off. But we did get a nice view there, even though we couldn't really see his head. This is the termite mound that he was on top of to start with. Quite a large termite mound. And since we're doing the size of things, I hope I don't fall off and imitate Taylor today. But we'll go climb up. So I'm... 172 centimeters, which is about five foot nine. So we did my foot size. Now here's me standing at the base of the termite mound. Okay. Climb a bit. This is how tall the termite mound is. Now I, I hope you guys can still hear, but I can see where that bird was resting, the little step buzzard. And he has been pecking away at the top of this mound and and getting termites out of it very 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 interesting now we've talked about how termites taste the winged alites the ones that fly out of the mound this time of year taste like peanut butter a little bit you can fry them up they're good the other termites i haven't eaten but i'm assuming they taste relatively decent all right, now that mound grows about the size of a soccer ball every year. And we're only seeing about one third of it out the top of the, the mound there. So that mound is several hundred years old. I mean, a soccer ball is about this big, a European football. And um, it takes years and years and years, as I was saying, to grow. And it's literally grain by grain by grain of soil to make that mound functioning impossible. It's absolutely incredible. Bobby, you're asking, do we ever see any heavy head Bobby, we get crows. We get pied crows that occur here. We don't get cape crows that occur here. Um, not there and in tuned with it. It's pretty amazing. Ooh, Mike, you're curious to know what my favorite part of safari is. Mike, I really love bushwalks. Bushwalking is my favorite part, but the thing I love most about bushwalks is I like to be quiet. <laughs> I like to be quiet and not talk and let the bush speak for itself.
actually it's just sort of a gentle come over here please he's found something that he wishes to show us Herbert what have you found a parasite where well, it's always quite embarrassing when you get to the point at which Herbert is describing something and you can't see what he's talking about uh, Herbert would you come over here oh I see it now thank you very much Oops. Look over there. There's a tick. Here's another tick. And here, in fact, is a better one. I'll bring it out for you. This one is alive. It has not been killed. Now, we know from this very tick... Stay there, okay? Stay there. We know from this tick what did this. This was probably made or rubbed onto here by a rhinoceros. This is a rhino tick. It is a female rhino tick. The female's got that sort of bib on her back like that. The male just has the sort of quite attractive markings, I suppose. The male just has the sort of quite attractive markings, I suppose. And, and I know this simply because Scott found one the other day and then Steph identified it for us all. So this is a rhino tick, and how it got here was that a rhino obviously went down to treehouse down, rolled in the mud, and then came past here, scraped the mud off, and this tick, and along with its... was scraped off onto the tree. It's now trying to hide, foul fellow that it is. Last... A lot of you, a whole lot of you went, ew, and he said, I'm not sure why you're going, ew, I understood completely while all of you were going, ew, because ticks are just, you know, they're ca carriers of disease. So that's the attractive rhino tick. It's got a really kind of warning color about it. And here's another one, which I'm going to place there, but I think it may just get blown away, Dave. I'll see what I can do. There we go. Nope, blown away. Too much wind. Sorry about that. That's called throwing a cameraman under the bus. All right, Rhino Tick, while I am sorely tempted to murder you, I'm not going to. I'm going to leave you there and wish you all the best and hope that a rhino comes past and you're able to bite him and get a bit of blood. Then I hope you're eaten by an ox picker. Now, we've just left Treehouse Dam where there was nothing and we're heading up back towards the clearings that lead us to the old hyena den. Herbert has now found something else. I don't know what it is. Herbert, what are we looking at here? Nothing. The tracks? He's just left me. Can you believe it? He's just dumped me here. That is... <laughs> ah! Oh! I think what he's got here is a stingless bee nest. I think. There are a lot of stingless bees around. Yes, look. And I think they're coming out of a hole over here. Can you see the stingless bees here, David? There are lots of them flying around my hand. But I'm not sure that that's what Herbert was pointing at. So let's look at the tracks anyway. All right, there we go. Now you can see the, the sort of sweat bees or stingless bees. And I'm sure there's a nest around here somewhere where they've put their sort of lemon-flavoured honey. Delicious. Doesn't that sound nice? Lemon-flavoured honey. All right, and we'll just have a quick look at this track over here, David. This is the track of a wildebeest. How do I know that, you say to yourself? Well, let me tell you. See how straight the line 
of the hoof is. On a kudu, or a, which would be smaller than this, and a water buck, which would be slightly smaller, you'll find it much rounder than this. So this has got very straight sides and very square front. That's how we know it is a wildebeest. And in fact, if we look here, what is this one now? This one I would say is a kudu. So you can see it's much rounder at the front. It's not as pointed as it would be on an impala's track. It's quite round and about the size of a kudu cow. She's going towards Treehouse Dam. The wildebeest, when it made this mark, had already finished its drink and was going back towards grazing grounds somewhere nearby. Okay, let us continue along this way. Herbert is standing up ahead, which makes me nervous because he's going to find something else that will be invisible to my, well, many would consider relatively trained eye until they were around Herbert. Chris, you're wondering about Gwen, the hyena, and if anybody has seen her at all. Uh, Chris, no, not as far as I know. Uh, we haven't seen her at the den for a while. I know I've been to the den three times since I got back here and I have yet to see a hyena there I know that Noel has been there a few times and those cubs still seem to be alive but that she is uh, absent or she's just never there when we're there so I'm not sure where she is or what's happened to her in fact the only hyena I've seen was a very old sort of scraggly looking female during our private rehearsal yesterday afternoon was it? No wasn't yesterday afternoon, it was two days ago in the afternoon. And we had a, no, it was the morning, sorry, two days ago in the morning. Uh, we had a very scraggly looking hyena, and she was missing half her top of ear, and she had no tail. Uh, that's the only hyena I've seen. So I really don't know what's going on with the hyenas, or why our clan has split up the way they have. He's indicating. Shall we come, Herbert? Should we come there? Oh, he's now pointing at the floor. Let me go quickly so that when he disappears, I will see where he's been looking. Now oh, he's left me. He's left, left me again. All right, we've got some elephant diggings here. Oh, this is what he was trying to show me. Look at this quite astonishingly industrious group of dung beetles. Look at that. Is that not amazing? Look at the size of it. Now, I was under the impression that what these things did was when there were two, they would be on their nuptial ball, so they'd go away and they'd mate on it, eat it, and then she would go away and then bury the egg ball or the brood ball. So why there are two on this ball, I'm not sure. That's where it comes from. See how they go underneath? And then they start to dig. And this is, a, this is not a new situation here. I mean, this ball has been around for a while. It's already got termites growing on it. Or not growing on it, living on it. A couple of ants. Quite a lot in the way of roots. And I suspect it was probably dug up. Perhaps by... What would have dug it up? It could easily have been dug up by a badger, I suppose, but there's no elephant actually that came past here because I think that the dung doesn't actually well there's some elephant dung around here but there's a lot of impala dung too isn't that amazing <laughs> that's fantastic alright now we are going to go across to Noel she's managed to find some signal with a bird Nicola that is known as the woodland kingfisher excellent Yes, James, <laughs> the land kingfisher. I'm trying to talk quietly because we're really close to this woodland kingfisher and I don't want it to 
fly away. I can hear other ones calling in the background, so I'm hoping that this one will call for us and maybe spread its wings and hop around so that we can see that beautiful little display just as we got here. There's two of them, but this one's the, the better showing of the moment. Um, they were busy uh, demonstrating to each other, opening wings and turning around and flashing the beautiful azure blue that's on the back of their wings there. Right now we're just seeing the fat little front. Ooh, thank you, darling. Thank you for preening. See how they move their feathers around, and also when they're doing that, there's a little bit of oil that's in place. They also take insects off that way. Now you can see that very uh, bicolored there. I'm going to go with bicolored. Sorry, I couldn't find my words. Top red beak, bottom black beak, very indicative of a woodland kingfisher, and a dark eye stripe through the eye slight sort of gray brown on top of the head and if this one would be so kind as to turn around you'll see that the whole back is blue 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 as opposed to having any sort of dark colors oh, sense thanks we couldn't do what we do without our cameraman just so i mean for most of you you'd be aware but obviously i can narrate all that i can but i can't do so without senzo being able to do the brilliant job that he does every day so let's just do hand claps you guys can send hand clap emojis i'm obsessed with emojis recently i don't really know why i think the whole concept is hysterical Turn their heads the way that this one is doing and looking side to side because they can't really see forward. They see more on the sides of their heads. It is looking possibly for something to eat. Now this kingfisher, which is I believe the the where James was trying to go with it, land kingfisher. It's it's a kingfisher that eats insects. It's not a kingfisher that actually fishes, and it will also eat things like lizards and skinks. I've also seen them getting little frogs. So when you do see this particular kingfisher diving into the water, it's mostly to clean itself. Becca, you're curious to know what is the largest insect we get in South Africa. Um, weight-wise, I'm unsure of Becca, but I think size and possibly weight-wise might be something like a rhino beetle. This one's a bit, this bird's a bit small to be able to eat something like that rhino beetle. It's going to eat uh, smaller insects. I do know that there's cockroaches that are larger than the size of my hand, and I have a relatively normal adult size hand, uh, but most of those cockroach species occur in more tropical areas, uh, so that would be sort of farther southeast of us, maybe in Durban, and then also in places like the Congo. Okay, the mate is calling. Oh, there's the blue, there's the blue. Do the yes. Now call for us. Listen, everyone, this is amazing. I have a sneaky suspicion that the one that is calling just above our heads is the male and the one that we were just focusing on recently is the female. Beautiful. Thanks, Senzo. Beautiful. Now, in other parts of Africa, this woodland kingfisher is called a... Um, a Senegal kingfisher open oh, then they're gone that was pretty good so the names that we're using here are not always the names that you'll get across the continent for instance a gray-headed kingfisher is also known as a rufous bellied kingfisher in other parts of Africa all right while we meander down the Muwati I'm actually looking for Hassana now let's see what Taylor is up to far 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 north and east of us in the Maasai Mara I believe she has something furry and has claws and that wants to eat things. Welcome again, everybody. Sorry about all the gremlins that we have been having in the Mara this morning. <laughs> it's given me some time to dry off, though, and the mud is starting to cake and crack along my leg. Oh. Sorry about that everyone. 
And well, he's a lovely male lion. He doesn't seem to mind the cars too much. And he's all on his own. I can't see any other boys around. He's a beautiful lion. I don't think I've come across this fella this morning. <laughs> his main male standing straight up. He's trying to dry off after the torrential downpour last night. He is a lovely, lovely cat though. He's not particularly old though. I'd put him at mm, maybe a four years old. He's not small. That's for sure. His mane is starting to develop quite nicely. He hasn't quite got the mane coming all the way around. Now he's gone up to that car. What are you doing, boy? Like he just had a smell. Sometimes what happens is when you do drive around on these roads, you can accidentally drive an animal dung, and then it does make them a little bit on the curious side. So I'm just going to quickly reposition. We're going to try and get onto the other side of that vehicle, and then we will view him. But how cool is that? So from having nothing and getting stuck and then slipping and falling face first into the mud this morning to having a beautiful big male line. We're not going to be able to follow him unfortunately. Uh, as you can imagine, it's very slippery out here. Way off to big man. And, and this particular area is not great. There's a lot of black cotton soil, so uh, off-roading would kind of be off-limits. I mean, well, in my in my case, it's one thing driving on the road and getting stuck, but if you are off-road doing something silly, then you kind of deserve it. But he's covered in flies, lots and lots of those biting flies, and I actually just fought with one. I did kill it. I'm not even going to tell a story. I murdered a midge that bit my leg. It was very sore, and uh, I don't feel any kind of oh, I don't feel bad at all and that's what they'll be doing as well they'll be biting that lion maybe that's why he's gonna go move or find a bit of shade he wouldn't have been sitting out here all day anyways it's not nice at all it's gonna be hot 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 in the Mara she with all the rain we're having it gets quite humid in the afternoon and then another storm starts to pour down and I think I know where he's going I think he's going to that big tall Bella 90s tree uh, just off to the left of him we should be able to see it in a minute. He's kind of beelining straight towards that, and I don't blame him. The Bellanites trees out here do cast the most perfect shadows, which make for good spots for lions to lay under, or leopards. No, he's going for a drink. That's what he's doing. Look how well camouflaged he is now. Now Craig you're wondering if the rain affects the animals coming out into the open. Um, when it is pouring with rain you might find some of them seeking a bit of shelter but for the last couple of evenings we've been sitting with lions in torrential downpours as we prepare for big cat week uh, coming up next week. Remember that's the 14th of December 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Nat Geo Wild in case uh, uh, you didn't know. Well, he didn't want to get his paws wet there so he leapt across a little bit of water. Uh, so yes and no I think it just depends on the end uh, the individual whether they're quite comfortable with the rain or not uh, sometimes when it does get a bit too hard they will go and find a bit of shelter under a tree or you know just sit in the opposite direction that the wind is blowing behind a shrub and that normally it will shelter them enough uh, it, I think it's just a particularly quiet morning the triangle hasn't been as busy as what it was when the migration was here so it makes it a bit tricky for us to find the animals and because of all the rain the grasses of course are thriving at the moment uh, which is great for all the animals except for us because it makes it hard to try and spot the, the game and I mean this grass isn't even tall this is probably a shorter section but you can see it's covering half that lion's body and as soon as he sits down in that grass we're not going to be able to see him anymore but let's watch him disappear it could be quite funny so how lucky are we that we did manage to get this male lion out on the road but for anybody else that comes past here once he does sit down they're going to have absolutely no idea that there's even a lion around just be lying about in the grass. But not racing off either, just taking his time. Off he goes. Bit of a breeze now too. I think we're going to be in for a windy afternoon. But we need it because that will help dry out some of the water that is sitting on the roads. Uh, which will be good for me. Maybe not Jamie and Brent and anyone else driving around because they can drive the cars properly. I apparently need some lessons. <laughs> so I sent uh, one of the videos, Archie, who's on camera with me today, uh, he made a, a quite a funny video. Can you believe it? He actually got me tripping and falling as well, which I thought was hilarious. He was out the car trying uh, to add the tow rope. So I sent the video he made to my dad and my dad 
he just laughed. He thought it was the funniest thing in the whole world. <laughs> and then called me an idiot. <laughs> ah, right, boy, where are you going to choose to sit? I think he's on his way there now. Or maybe he'll go even further. Perhaps he's not just going to go and look for some shade. Maybe he's going to go for a bit of a hunt. Now, it's not uncommon to see such young male lions all on their own roaming around. There are actually plenty of uh, and and he's gone completely disappearing into the long grass how cool is that so that's a magic trick for this morning and we are going to move away from our lion now otherwise we'll just sit here for hours and hours and hours and hope that he pops his head up just every now and then so we won't bank on that <laughs> but at least the mara is back up and running again i'm so sorry nikki please can you say that again i didn't quite hear what she said to me why is my volume so soft? We turn that right up. Sometimes I turn the volume down. Ooh. And my shoes are very, very muddy at the moment. Now, I'm not sure who I'm sending you across to in South Africa and in the Sabi sand, whether it's James or Noel. I'm sure you'll enjoy what they have to show you. We did have some birds we wanted to show you, but I'm afraid they've had about four birthdays since we first saw them. They've flown away. But there's some kind of insect emergence around here. Red-billed buffalo weavers and wattled starlings and drongos going together. Anyway, let's not worry about that. The last time, or one of the first times we had some nasty picture breakup earlier today, was with a leopard. ...to come and see if we can't have a better look at this leopard orchid here, also flowering. It's in another tree that's impossible to climb. It's really quite clever. You see it there, David? Gorgeous. Mm. Now, before we were rudely interrupted last time, what I was wanted to tell you was that you get two species here. Ancelia africana and Ancelia gigantea. One of which has the brown spots and one of which is just plain yellow. Now, do you think that I can remember which one is which? No, I cannot. But if I was to take a 50-50 stab at it, I think that the one with the brown spots is the one called Gigantia, and the one without... I'm not sure how long we've been back live or how long we've been off. Frankly, I fell asleep in a drainage line. It was extremely pleasant listening to the singing of some wattled starlings in the trees above, the gentle breathing of Herbert and David as they uh, contemplated their lives here on planet Earth. It would be a pleasant way to spend a Sunday after morning. After morning. Sunday after morning. <clears throat> here is a grass. A Cetaria species, I think, of some sort, perhaps Cetaria sphacelata, and much like with the first one we started with, remember David? Mm. We had lots of male parts on it, there they are, and they're one that is either about to flush with its male parts, or is not going to at all. Isn't that lovely? I can't, it, I think it is a Cetaria species of some kind, but I'm not sure which one. Really pretty. An ideal grass to put in one's beak while one is walking. Would you like one, David? Yes. You would. Thank you. There you are. Thank you. Marvellous. Good. On we go. Here's the same grass that's come out in slightly more exuberant flushes of male bits. I feel like saying male bits is the wrong way to, descri to describe it. There it is, a Cetaria species. Apparently some of them quite good for grazing, some of them not so good. Now I'm hoping still before the end of the show to show you the um, oh come on The flower we started with, with the purple bract, the bract bractiosus. Syncolo, syncolostenum bractiosus, that's it. 
I'm hoping to find you one before we end because many of you will be waiting on tenterhooks to know exactly what I was talking about, won't you? Yes, I know you will. Don't worry, I'll do my best. And despite all of the technical difficulties we've had today, let's see what else we can find up through here. I'm also desperately looking for a site where there are caterpillars because I need some caterpillars for my big cat week hosting job in the TV show because of course caterpillars has the word cat in it. You see David? Yes. Yes. Kirsten came up with that, it wasn't me. Ah. What else is up here? I think I'm the only feed, everybody, so I'm afraid you're stuck with me for now. And David, of course. Now, here we have the lion's eye plant. Very nice. I'll tell you a story about the lion's eye. Here is one, David. There, I'm not going to pick it. People become offended if I pick the flowers. Uh, rightly so, rightly so. I picked one the other day, didn't pick it, I dug it up out of the ground, put it in a pot because I wanted to use it for Big Cat Week on account of the fact that its name is Lion's Eye. Get it? Good. And its root is about a foot long. I dug it out and then I put it in a pot and I thought it was going to die. And it has rallied somehow. I've sort of wrapped it round, uh, folded it in on itself and potted it in the pot and put, there was actually some potting soil so I used that and some fertilizer, a bit of water or Nicola put water on it and it rallied after 24 hours and is now living. And so we'll feature on television, can you believe it, in the not too distant future, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, the December the 14th, that's Thursday night, where you are in America and Friday morning for us and Friday afternoon in Australia and possibly in Fiji as well. Good. Except you'll have to watch it on the internet. You won't be able to watch it on TV. <clears throat> All righty. Pajamas Patterson is, uh, got out of her pajamas and she has managed to find herself something that is uh, uh, carrying things for holiday, if you know what I mean. You know, like a big suitcase of the morning. Look at this tiny little elephant. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say about it. It's a couple of weeks old at the most. It's got a little friend who wanted to play with it earlier but I think it's a little bit too young to be enticed into boisterous games just yet. And a little trunk sniffing everywhere. Saying hello to mom. Bit wobbly. Little bit wobbly. Still not quite a hundred percent on this whole walking thing. And as for the flappy thing on the front of its face, well, that'll take a little while to master. Hey, baby. You are so cute. Something to make it all worthwhile for those of you who stuck with us through the gremlins. We do appreciate it. Thank you. And I have some really nice news for you. You know the marsh breakaways, the lionesses, the three lionesses, they've got four biggish cubs. Well, remember weeks ago, Manu and I filmed that tiny screaming little cub in the drainage line? Well, there's three of them, and they've just been introduced to the Pride. We saw them for the first time while the gremlins were attacking. Unfortunately, we had to leave as the, the road was sort of in that whole drainage system, and it was just getting boggier and boggier. And we were about to run the risk of quite quickly taking Taylor's marshmallow crown from her. Oh, so lovely. <laughs> now you've got to come and navigate this rather tricky patch of ground, little one. Come on, everybody else is going across. Best catch up. <laughs> Did it, Mummy? Oh. Such a beautiful size comparison. Which way are we going? Here we go now, up the other side, through the mush. Through the mush, and the friend's waiting for you. Friend's so excited to see you. Yes, look. 
That's a friend for you. <laughs> oh, even Manu's chuckling back here. Oh, best friends for life. There's going to be years and years of games ahead for these two little munchkins. Similar, similar age, related to each other, cousins. I didn't see if, it, if we had males or females here, but either way, they are going to be the best of buddies. They're so tiny they actually disappear into the grass, which is not something one often says about elephants. Sweet. Is the game done now? Oh, were you mightily offended by something that was said? Oh, coming back. <laughs> Little one's not quite certain about this whole thing. It's all rather new and a bit overwhelming. The elephants are just having the best time at the moment. There's so much water around. <laughs> now, <laughs> they're all coming across. Hello. Don't worry, Mum. I didn't do anything. It's okay. It's okay. I'm just sitting here. Don't look at me like that. I'm just sitting here. Don't you mind me. Okay. That's just one female gave us a bit of a head shake. And you two at the back, what are you doing there? Is it all just too much? It's just too much, huh? Attention overwhelming. Okay, as our Ellie roadblock moves away, let's head across back to South Africa to Scott who has found something that has lots and lots of stripes. Now, even though these zebras seem relaxed and unaware of any threats, there are two very hungry animals quite close to them. Those two hungry animals are myself and Ferg. Thankfully, I think the zebra are probably a little bit too quick for us to catch and eat, and I'm not sure how tasty zebra is for us humans anyway. Only kidding. Um, we're here on the quarantine clearings, and I think these are the first zebra I've seen since I've been back. So, enjoying looking at them and the differences between these. Oh, maybe it's not just Ferg and I that are hungry. Maybe there is something else. What was that? Uh, it was an impala that kind of ran behind some bushes there. You may just see a few flashes of orangey brown. And it was that impala that gave the zebra a bit of a fright. And that's why they all came running towards us. And it's the windy conditions that are making them a little bit uneasy. Very good. So, like I was saying, these zebra are quite a lot different to the zebra you'll see with Jamie, Brent and Taylor up in the Mara. The main difference being their size. These will be a little bit bigger than the Grant's zebra up in the Mara. As well as, in the terms of appearance, these guys have got a brown shadow between their black stripes so they're not as smart looking I don't think as the zebra up in the Mara. Very good. We shall continue perusing and see if we can find you anything else of interest before the end of the safari. I know there's not much longer to go. Seems like we've been having a few technical difficulties but fear not we have a Russian genius who's busy cracking some codes all the way up in Kenya trying to make everything work again from what I understand everything's okay outside I think it's the YouTube technicians or YouTube have somehow dropped the ball we'll blame it on them today sorry YouTube I'm told everything is okay on our side always fascinates me the technical side of things because my little brain just can't even begin to comprehend how it all works, but I find it surprising how some days it works and some days it doesn't. So it seems like now we will be sending you back up to the Masai Mara to see if everything is still working with the stream up there. I'm not sure who you're going to, but you'll find out shortly. Go ahead. Don't stop there. Hello. Please don't stop. Okay, there we go.
<laughs> let's let's quickly, Manu, let's quickly move on to the other side of the road before this next car comes through and does the same thing. Where's the best view? Hey, girls. There was lots of talking while you were with Scott. Lots of deep rumbles from the elephants. I don't know what they were saying to each other. I don't know what was said and got a response in that way. But they all suddenly formed a defensive circle briefly and then relaxed and started feeding again. If I had to guess, and it would be entirely guesswork, I would say one of them probably smelt lions from last night and rumbled to the rest of them to just be on the lookout. And then they realized that the scent was old or they realized that there were no lions and they immediately relaxed again. If I had to guess, that would be what I would guess happened there. I wish we could have an elephant translator. We do our best. That's as much as we can do. Here we go. Now being harassed by a slightly large elephant. So that little one, the one on the left, that's the one that was playing with the tinier baby. You can see it's got a floppy ear. But the tiny baby didn't really want to play and went running off with mum. So now it's got a larger cousin that's decided to come and entertain itself. Now the tables have turned slightly. Now going to be pushed around. And that floppy ear will probably stay floppy for the rest of its life. Oh, oh. The elephant's favourite game of push and shove each other. So sweet. Okay. As our little elephants entertain themselves on this bright, beautiful Mara morning, Taylor has found a bird that is found almost anywhere, whether you're in Kenya or South Africa. Ah, our Egyptian goose, Jamie, has morphed into a spur wing goose now, which is still pretty cool. In fact, and there's a pair of them wading through the marsh, but I'm not even going to do any more talking. I'm going to let nature do the talking. So everybody turn the volume up as loud as it can go. Isn't that incredible, all the different sounds of bullfrogs and butchers, cacos and a variety of other amphibians that I probably have no idea what they are. But this is going to be a very cool spot. I think Brent is going to love this the most because of all the bird life around here. Oh my goodness, I could sit for hours and hours just naming the different types of birds. But before I do, very quickly, there's a hummer cork that has just caught a huge frog in the road in the middle. Can you see it down there? There it is. It's trying to kill it, I think. Oh my goodness. I don't know what type of... Is it blown itself up to try and protect itself? That hummer cork is now trying to kill it. And it is bouncing off of the ground. Come on, frog, you can do it, frog or toad. I don't know which one you are. It's still kicking a little bit, but it won't survive for too long, I'm afraid. It's going to succumb to the beak of that hummer corp. But what a fantastic morning it has been from listening to Jamie and I giggling away as I face planted into the mud, to seeing lions and all sorts of other things. Thank you for joining us on the Sunrise Safari. We'll maybe see you a little bit later.